Pitaha. Uh, with that, I would like to give a quick introduction of Dr. Muhammad Hamad Zaman, uh, who is a graduate from University of Chicago, NMIT, and now at Boston University, uh, serving as a professor of biomedical engineering and international health. Professor Zaman's current research is focused on developing robust technologies and system level solutions to improve the quality of medicine. He's a renowned public speaker and an author of many publications, and his latest book, Bitter Pills, The Global War on Counterfeit Drugs. Uh, Dr. Hamazan, I would like to welcome you to our webinar. At this time, I will make you a presenter so you can actually share your slides as well as uh, you can uh, start your presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Zaheer and, and, and uh, Zafar and Taha. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm really honored to be in the company of uh, people and speakers who have a uh, tremendous amount of experience from the industry side, from the entrepreneurial angle, as well as from various aspects of leadership. Uh, my talk is going to be somewhat different. It's going to sort of talk about how the journey starts uh, from academia into impact. And we'll talk about both the business opportunities and the impact that it can create at a global level. I hope that this is one of the many conversations I'll have with you and the attendees. Um, I'm always available and eager to talk and hear from uh, people with various backgrounds and their perspectives. So let's think about uh, the challenges. But before that, I want to talk a little bit about myself and where I come from. So um, I come, uh, I grew up in, in Islamabad. I was born in Islamabad in 1977. I grew up in Islamabad. Uh, my father was an academic. He was uh, formerly the vice chancellor of Qaid Azam University. Uh, but he died when I was very young. Um, I was only 10, not, not quite 11. And the reason I mention it is because that experience of growing up with my mother and two sisters, my brother left uh, to get his PhD at that time. I grew up with my mother and the two sisters. So being fairly young in that environment really taught me a lot. And it taught me the value of social justice. It taught me the value of caring for others, but most importantly, it taught me how to look at the world from the perspective of uh, women and the challenges that they face. And in many ways, that has continued with me all my life. Um, and a lot of the work that I do is often on maternal health and women's health and children's health. So that period of about five or six years or about eight years from 1988 to 1996, when I was in Islamabad with my mother and two sisters, uh, really was formative in uh, every respect uh, of who I am uh, on my perspective, my vision, and how I look at the world. So from Pakistan, I ended up interestingly at a place in the middle of Arkansas. And the story goes is that um, I uh, was interested in studying chemistry. And at that time in Pakistan, you could either study engineering or medicine, but I was interested in sciences. And I applied and my family couldn't afford a whole lot. So I went to a place, a very small school, um, where I had a full scholarship. And that was very important for me because I didn't want to be a burden on my family and certainly not on my mother by any means. Um, I uh, studied and studied hard. And in, in a period of a couple of years, I finished my bachelor's with a degree in chemistry and physics and a, and a major and a minor in mathematics. From there, I went to University of Chicago, uh, which was the place uh, to study physical chemistry um, if you wanted to be sort of uh, really academically rigorous. And that's where I went. And I was there from 1999 to 2003. And I'll talk about my mentors in a second. But this was a formative time uh, for me as I started to think about what I wanted to do in life and, and what are the kinds of questions that I deeply cared about. From there, I went to MIT, uh, where I was a postdoc for three years. Uh, Again, this was an important time in helping me try to understand the kinds of things that I cared about and the research questions that I wanted to pursue. My first academic position was at the University of Texas in Austin, where I was uh, from 2006 to 2009. Uh, it was a wonderful time, the first time I was truly independent as a researcher, as a scientist, uh, and I had the freedom to look at the questions that I cared about. And then in 2009, I got recruited back to Boston at Boston University. Uh, and I went through the stages of uh, tenure and becoming a full professor and then on endowed chair. And, and I've been there um, ever since, um, sort of uh, for the last nine years. 
So this was sort of the typical journey, uh, not very unusual, except for the fact that in many ways, the things that were happening around me were shaping uh, my worldview. Then um, here, it's important to recognize various people who helped me become the person that I am. And these are the four people who I would start off with. So on the le left two are my PhD advisor, Steve Berry, who was the Undersecretary of State for um, Energy uh, in the 1970s in the Carter administration, a very renowned um, physical chemist. Uh, my other mentor was Tobin Sosnick. Uh, he was my co-advisor for PhD. Uh, a phenomenal um, person who uh, really gave me the opportunity to become the person that I am. And what I mean by that is he would push me when I wanted to be pushed. He would leave me alone when I wanted the, the freedom. And so he worked with me in really helping me think through what I cared about, what are the questions. But most importantly, he helped me understand the value of rigor of really going after A plus things and not settling for anything less, no matter how much effort it takes. I mean, the story goes, this is late 1990s, early 2000s, um, is that I would send him an email at midnight and he would analyze the data and would have the response back before I would come back to lab in the morning. So he worked as hard as I did, just because he wanted to sort of really encourage me and really be there for me. And he's been a phenomenal mentor. On the right hand side are two of my mentors from MIT. Uh, and these were the people who just gave me the freedom. So I rarely saw them. They were always around and available if I needed, but they also didn't want to be imposing and telling me what to do. They wanted to sort of get out of my way and let me be um, creative. They gave me the opportunity to try new things, to fail and learn from those failures, always be there for my um, failures if I needed them, but at the same time, not sort of impose their worldview on me. At the bottom are a whole bunch of people who over the years have shaped my worldview. So on the left is Nicholas Peppers, a professor at the University of Texas, who um, was there as my mentor when I started. Next to him is Christy Anseth. She's a professor at the University of Colorado. She helped me understand how to write good grants and how do you make a case. And the person next to her is Jim Collins. He used to be at BU and is now at MIT and has been my mentor in telling me how to teach, how to make an effective uh, case for what you want to teach and how do you sort of really bring the energy and enthusiasm. After that is Jerry Kirsch. He was the head of uh, National Institutes of Health Global Health Division and has always been a mentor. And the right two people, uh, Christine Schmidt was also a mentor at University of Texas and Rebecca Richards Cordham is a person I've never worked with her. But she is an inspiration in a way that I look up to her as somebody who has done a phenomenal job in creating technologies for the world's absolute poorest. So she has helped develop new technologies for uh, pneumonia, for sepsis, for neonatal jaundice, works largely in Malawi, a uh, little bit of work in Pakistan as well, but largely in Malawi and in South Africa. But she is a person I look up to if I want to see how does one sort of straddle academia and research and innovation and impact. And one of the things that I've learned from my mentors is that you have to choose a variety of mentors across disciplines. People, some people may guide you in one thing and some others may guide you in another. And some of my inspirations are actually people who are not even alive. I mean, so I read regularly about people, some from 500 years ago, some from 2000 years ago. And I sort of feel a sense of connection with them in learning about things. How does one make an impact? How does one think about problems and so on and so forth? All right, so this was the story of how I learned to do things. And you know, every now and then, uh, there comes a point in your life and something happens and things change. And you realize and you see, feel that this is the kind of problem that I want to work on, that this is something I cared about. And this happened in January of 2012. So Lahore, where my father grew up, and a city that I have um, great fondness for, was in the midst of the worst public health crisis in Pakistan's history. And that was the Punjab Institute of Cardiology scandal or an issue where about, uh, I would say 200 or so people died in a matter of a week, a week and a half. And as we often tend to do, there were all kinds of conspiracy theories and terrorism and all of that. And it turned out that none of that was actually the case. It was a situation where these largely poor people who were dependent on the government healthcare 
were given medicines that were tainted. So instead of getting medicines that were supposed to um, sort of control their blood pressure and hypertension, the medicines were contaminated with an anti-malarial, it got deposited in their bone marrow, and the immunity went down and they died, and, and, and a fairly painful death. And you know, in the strangest of ways, I felt that I had to do something about it. Uh, the issue of bad medicines was something that we all are familiar with, but the fact is that there was nothing getting done from the government side, from the regulator side, from the hospital side, from the pharmacy side, it was just deeply, deeply troubling. And even though my research in this area was very small, this, this issue really spoke to me. And my message to all of us is that every now and then an opportunity, an issue, a, a problem comes along that really speaks to you. And it's your choice whether to sort of jump on that or not. Uh, and I did. And when I looked at the problem, I realized that this was not a problem of Pakistan alone. It was a problem of sort of the world in, in, in every sense of the word, including developed and developing countries. There was a famous heparin scandal in the US in 2006, drugs coming from China. China itself has had significant problems, India, UK, Bangladesh, around the world. Uh, certainly the impact is significant, uh, far more significant in low-income countries, but that doesn't mean that it's a problem of these places alone. And I started sort of really sort of becoming a student all over again, trying to learn what's going on. Why does this happen? How could we allow in this day and age, this unfairness to go on? This has to stop. The people who are vulnerable and poor, largely women and children, but otherwise as well, they suffer a lot. And that should not be acceptable. And, and I really sort of got uh, concerned about this. So I started working on this. And I learned that there are four major uh, sort of aspects of the problem. We tend to think that there's some kind of a mafia and, and working in the shadows that makes the problem uh, sort of appear. And that is true to a certain extent, but that's not the only part. At the top left side, is a picture of a cough syrup factory near Lahore, right? So this was a picture that was taken by a, a colleague of mine. Certainly something that should not be acceptable, but the fact is that this is the reality. And the top right is a picture that I took myself in Ghana. Um, you can see the expiration date of uh, uh, 1013, but the reality is that this was taken in March of 2014 six months after it should have been expired and hadn't even got to the market. This was on its way to the pharmacies. So this is something completely unacceptable. On the bottom left is what we would call intentional deception or falsification, where there are two um, uh, drugs or two uh, sort of bottles here that look exactly the same and one of them is real and one of them is not. And they are meant to deceive the customer or consumer. And at the bottom is, a, is an example of West Africa um, again, a place where I've worked quite a bit. I didn't take this picture though, um, of no regulation. You can essentially buy any medicine you want. And to a certain extent, we see this in Pakistan as well, where the prescription laws non, are non-existent. You can get essentially any drug from the pharmacy you want. So that increases the chance of uh, things getting in, uh, into people's hands uh, without any checks and balances. So we were very, very concerned about this. And, and I started writing grants and I started working with colleagues to think about what we need to do. Uh, the other aspect of the problem that became even more troubling was the fact that those who are custodians of uh, quality, the, the FDAs in low-income countries, the, the drug regulatory authorities, the, the um, groups that are in charge of ensuring that drugs should be of appropriate quality themselves did not have that act together. In this case, this is a picture from Kenya that I took myself. Um, and it's this is a drug testing lab. And it doesn't give you any confidence that they can really stop the problems here. So this really spoke to me that something has to be done, that we need to make sure that we are able to come up with technology that address this issue, this, this problem that affects people, vulnerable people, uh, sick people who are already sort of suffering. And this is uh, what makes it worse. And that should not happen. Not on my watch and, and, and we, we have to do everything we can. So out of that came a technology that we've been working on for the last, I would say, six or seven years. Uh, we call it PharmaCheck. Um, the, the fundamental mission of PharmaCheck is to accurately and affordably test quality of medicines at all points in the field. So this could be right at the manufacturing level. This could be at the first entry point because the drugs are largely manufactured uh, in 
a few countries, not all countries, and certainly low-income countries mostly import their drugs or get them in donation. It could be the first storage point, the second storage point, the hospital, the pharmacy. One thing we made sure, and that is a question that we decided on early on, was this notion that we are not going to burden the consumer to have to pay for testing their drug quality. If you are a pregnant mother who has had to travel a great distance to get drugs for the unborn child or herself, or if you have a sick kid, it should not be your responsibility to then have to pay for testing of that drug as well. That should just not be acceptable. So by design, our technology is not focused on the end point consumer. It is focused upstream of that, right? So it is focused on governments, on pharmacies, on hospitals, on, on regulators, but not on the individual consumer. That should not be the case. So that's the, the sort of big picture of the device. So um, we have gone through several prototypes. I'm sure many of you may have questions about where we are. So we have done a lot of testing um, in Ghana. And the reason we did it in Ghana was because our initial grant was for malaria and uh, the funding was for Ghana. We have done some work in Indonesia. Um, we are also now uh, planning some uh, work hopefully in, uh, in TB hospitals in Karachi, um, as well as in refugee camps. And I'll tell you that in a second. So the way it works is that we have developed a series of molecules that would bind to the drug in question. So let's say you want to test uh, a TB drug. We have molecules that would specifically and sensitively bind only to that TB molecule, not to any impurity, not to something that may look alike, only to the good molecule. And we can detect that signal, and that signal um, can tell us how much active ingredient or real product is in there. The whole thing, this is the latest prototype that I'm showing, um, is about 10, 12 pounds in weight. Um, it's the size of a laptop, a little bit uh, slightly bigger. Um, and the idea is that the user in this case, whoever that is, a pharmacist, a, um, a regulator, some government employee, uh, a chemist, essentially has to do nothing except for putting the pill and putting the right probe. So he or she wants to test a malaria pill, puts the malaria probe in there, puts the pill, and that's it. It's fully automated. It can be in local languages, it's in English and French right now. And it's basically the idea is that it's a little cassette that you put in for the probe, even based because of environmental issues is all managed. Um, we have uh, backup batteries, um, eventually it might be uh, it's solar as well, but the whole thing is fully self-consistent. And it is also important that we don't burden the person with extensive sample prep or extensive analysis. If they just want to see a number, that this is how many milligrams is in there, we get the number, he or she may get the number. If the person wants to get extensive detail about all the assay and the, and the curves and the, all the data, that's also in there. And certainly there, there are opportunities for growth as well. Um, we are, I would say, uh, probably a year or so before we can start to commercialize it. We are in, in late stage testing right now in, um, in, in Ghana uh, as well. Um, I take a group of my students uh, to these places to understand the local culture and the dynamics. This is a group that I've taken of students and, and collaborators in, in Tanzania and Zanzibar. Um, and the idea is unless and until we understand the local context, the local market, the local dynamics, the local stakeholders, we won't be able to make any impact. Our goal here is not to sell the technology alone our goal here is to really think about how would we save lives and how would we make sure that the people who are most vulnerable are protected and and what is the appropriate model for that so so it's important for us to really think about those things one of the things that i have started working on in the last i would say couple of years and this is something that is really another problem that is speaking to me and, and i care deeply about it is that of refugee camps. So this is with me and my students at uh, the refugee camp in Zahli in, in Lebanon at the border of uh, uh, Syria and, and Lebanon. And you know, these people who are in these camps have not done anything wrong. They are uh, just as kind and as open and as warm as anybody you would meet. And, and I have stories to tell that are just so, uh, I mean, warm about how wonderful these people are. But they have faced, they're facing quite a bit of challenges. And among those challenges is this notion that many of the drugs these people get from formal or informal markets are not of the right quality. 
So how do you address that in refugee camps, places where they are no man's land? They are not responsibility of Lebanese government alone. Syrian government certainly doesn't care much about them. So somebody has to really do something. So we are working closely with UNHCR as well as a number of NGOs uh, and, and other partners in making sure that we can understand what are the, the various sort of uh, qualities of drugs, in this case, again, life-saving commodities, and, and trying to understand and improve those supply chains as well. So one of our, our areas of impact is refugee camps, and we're doing similar projects in the refugee camps in Uganda. These are refugee, refugees from uh, Somalia, South Sudan, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Angola, and they've been there for, for a good 20 years. And I'm sure the Rohingya crisis will also lead to similar challenges. I mean, the reality is that the refugee problem is, is becoming worse. It's not getting any better. Um, last year, there were about 65 million refugees who were displaced out of their homes all over the world because of conflict. And their healthcare uh, is not in the best of situations. Their host communities are also challenged and are suffering. So I think I think that's a responsibility that falls on all of us. And as an engineer, as an engineering faculty, as a scientist, as a citizen of the world, I feel strongly about it. And I want to sort of contribute my research towards uh, 